Now, Reggie, in in the lesson, you said that Galatians was probably written after Paul's first missionary journey, but before the Council of Jerusalem. Um, now, I've heard some people have different takes on when the letter was actually written. How would our interpretation of the book differ if, say, it was written at a later time or perhaps even to a different audience? So in the first place, if it was written not to the Southern folks, then we don't have as, uh, as much information about what the background issues are. We have to kind of just do some guesswork from the letter itself. But if we can locate it right after the first missionary journey to the folks that were involved in the first missionary journey, then we can better piece together exactly what happened. Um, in the second place, if it was written later into the Northern Galatian people, we have this, we have the, a, a challenge in just trying to figure out why if the council in Jerusalem in chapter 15 dealt so straightforward forwardly with the whole question of should Gentiles get circumcised, why Paul didn't just end the conversation by, by citing that letter when he wrote this, um, by, by why he didn't just talk about that decree when he wrote this letter. So um, if we date it l later, the scholars who do that think that it would have been written right around the time of the letter to the Romans. So what the interpreters then do is just read Galatians more like side by side with the letter to the Romans. And that, that is interesting in its, in its own regard. But still, I think it makes more sense of the whole scenario between Acts and the letter to the Galatians to see them at, to see this letter as coming after the first missionary journey, before the Jerusalem Council, and several years before the letter to the Romans. And that's interesting because it means Paul's whole, con whole concern about works of the law, as opposed to faith in Christ, is an abiding one that carried through his ministry. In Acts 13, um, Paul turns from the unbelieving Jews and begins to direct his ministry uh, toward the Gentiles. Um, isn't it a bit harsh that Paul rejects the unbelieving Jews in this way? Well, um, Dusty, I, I think the tone that we should hear in, in Paul's voice when he says we turn to the Gentiles is not really so much harshness as it is profound disappointment. And now, uh, we, we need to know that Paul never de turns decisively away from his Jewish countrymen. His program continues to be throughout his ministry to go to whatever Jews he can find to talk with first, whether it's Lydia and company alongside the river in Philippi or whether there's a synagogue, he'll go. And, and it's... And, what his hope is, is that his fellow Jews will see what he has come to see, uh, quite to his own surprise, that all their hopes and dreams for being the bearers of God's, God's grace and mercy and justice and holiness to the world has been realized through Messiah, Jesus. And uh, he... Is going to go. To, he is going to go to the Gentiles with or without them. He always hopes that he can take he can take Jews with him on on that mission, and um, he is he, he is somebody who has always understood God's promises to Israel are the matter of God's promise to Abraham to bless the nations through Israel. What he, he thought that that was some far off thing. He certainly wouldn't have thought it would, would happen through a crucified Messiah. And his world just gets tur turned upside down. And he, he's just insistent on, on continuing to go to his people when he can to bring them along to fulfill. The, well, the terms that he uses in Acts 13 are those of Isaiah 49, 
to be a light to the Gentiles. And he just hopes throughout that his people uh, will get it about, about Messiah and, and come with him. So is it kind of almost like overspeak in such a way saying like, I, you know, shaking you know, the dust off my, my clothes to the Jews and turning to the Gentiles as a, a way of urging his Jewish brothers and sisters to, to see? Yeah, it, very much so. And it's like, okay, if you don't get it now, I'm going to go and I'm going to pursue this ministry as, as hard as I can in hopes that, as he writes in Romans 11 later on, that his people will be, will be provoked to jealousy to say, wow, you know, look what, look what we're getting in on. Uh, I mean, look what we're missing out on. We need to get in on this. And, um, you know, folks of us, folks like myself who are from a Gentile background really need to take a hard look at Paul and recognize that, that the impatience that Westerners eventually developed about Jews not getting it about the gospel and the whole history of anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism, pogroms and violence against Jews and shunning, who has no basis in the New Testament at all. And especially in this one who said, you know, I, I would just as soon be cut off for my people and never, never wrote them off and never wrote, never wrote or spoke harshly, even when he was writing and speaking with, with great profound disappointment. But it was always a disappointment that was tinged with the, oh Lord, have mercy, have mercy on me and have mercy on my countrymen. Now, Reggie, Paul uses some pretty harsh language um, in the letter to the Galatians. Oh, yeah. Oh, you foolish Galatians yeah. who's bewitched you. Yeah, right. I mean, some really hard stuff. I mean, is there anything particularly heinous about what the Galatians were doing? Is, is he just talking this way to, to make it sound big? Or, is, I mean, is there really something that's nasty going on here? Well, hello. <laughs> Jesus hung on the cross, shed his blood to cover our sins. And these guys want to have believers shed their blood to express their solidarity with, with, with Jesus. And Paul's going, don't you get it? Your blood would never suffice. And that's why he had, he, he had to shed his blood because your blood would never be enough. And to think that it would call upon anybody else to shed their blood after Christ has shed his blood is just, well, it gets the big anathema. It gets the big, don't go there. So, um, I mean, in this respect, he thinks a lot like the writer to the Hebrews who goes, all the other priests have to keep doing their job over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And what marks our priests, what marks our priest is that his work has been done once. He took the, he underwent the whole curse. And for him, even for him, that means whatever is going to undo that work really needs to be done away with. So Reggie, are, is there any similar um, teachings, false teachings today that would compare to the magnitude of those teachings uh, that Paul was addressing in Galatia? Well, I think the rule of thumb, Dusty, is if, if I'm being told that what Christ did on the cross was, was good, but not quite enough, mm -hmm. and that I need to add to it, then I, you know, you're in this uh, Paul danger zone. And um, that means, you know, how do I confess my sin? Because I continue to sin, but how do I express my sorrow over my sin? Do I simply acknowledge it? Well, Paul, I think, would say, okay, but do I go punish myself? Do I, you know, do I take a knife and cut myself? Do I take some sort of a whip and beat myself on the back? Mm -hmm. That, and, and unfortunately, I've known people that they kind of feel like, you know, they mess up so bad. How could God love them anymore? 
and what can they do to get themselves back in into God's favor? And that kind of thinking shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the situation that exists because now we are sons and daughters. We are accepted in the beloved and we are loved not because we shed our blood, but because he shed his blood for us. Mm-hmm. Well, and another thing is, is um, these people want to go back under the law and what they're gonna wind up doing is adding to God's commandments. And whenever you, whenever you add to God's commandments and say, and make the whole, our relationship with him a matter of following a code instead of pursuing a relationship, then I think you're gonna have Paul coming down on you. When it becomes not a matter of his work in us through the Holy Spirit, because we're now clean and he dwells in us, then I think you're gonna have Paul getting all upset with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, what Paul's talking about is that, that it's not about us shedding our blood in addition to Jesus shedding his blood for our sins. And, it, and it's not about us adding rules to God's law, um, you know, that, that those things are, are separate from his gospel. But there's, this, there's a section when he's talking about his interaction with Peter uh, that Peter was eating with the Gentiles and having a great time, and then these guys from Jerusalem come up, and then he, like, separates from the Gentiles, and Paul seems to lay into him pretty good. Is there something else going on there as well? Yeah, Graham, I think that's it's very perceptive because Paul, that really does become the occasion for Paul to get all over the Galatians because he, he connects some dots the implication is if you haven't gone all the way and shed your own blood and, be, and, um, and come under the law in this respect, you are not a true citizen of Israel. And God had already dealt with Peter about you know, who his true Israel is, who his true people are. They're all those who belong by faith to Israel through Israel's Messiah, Jesus, Jew and Gentile alike. That was straightened out for Peter back in, um, in, um, in Acts 10 and 11 when the angel appeared to him and showed him that, that God declared all foods to be clean. And he went to Cornelius' house, the, the Gentile Roman centurion, preached the gospel. God baptized those people in the spirit, gave them faith, and didn't require them to become circumcised. And as far as Peter was concerned, they are just as much Jews as, as I am. And Peter understood that. But, and then he comes up to, he comes up to uh, Antioch, where um, Paul has been ministering, and he has full table fellowship with Gentile Christians. And and thereby fully accepts them into the people of God, just like him, under the same terms, the shedding of Jesus' blood. But then when certain people come from Jerusalem out of concern or concern for their consciences, out of fear of them or whatever, he withdraws from table fellowship with these Gentiles. And Paul realizes the implications of that are Christ's blood was not enough for them somehow they would have to add to that work and, and become like full ethnic, uh, gen, full, full ethnic Jews. And what, what has happened in Paul's whole theology is his whole view of God has had to be reconfigured to realize that Jesus Christ is just as much Lord as the Father. And so he's, he's rejuggled his, his conception of God himself to include Jesus in, in the deity. He's had to adjust his sense of how Israel fulfills her destiny to reach the nations, it's, it's through Jesus. And he realizes now that Israel is, has always been a spiritual concept, a, 
a, a root, a tree that includes natural branches and now grafted in branches. And so it's very, very important for him that there be this picture of, a, of one people of God, and the, the true Israel made up of all who trust in Christ, Israel's Messiah. So there's not like you've got Israel on the one hand and then the church on the other, sort of two roads kind of heading in the same direction that someday we'll meet up again. No, for, for Paul, he sees it he sees it completely differently than that. He sees the whole the whole narrative of Old Testament history being the bringing together of 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 all of God's promises for his people through Jesus the Messiah. And now everybody who belongs to Jesus the Messiah belongs to the Father. And because Jesus the Messiah is the true, the one true obedient faithful Israelite who receives God's favor, favor for his for his obedient life, for his keeping the keeping the moral law, keeping the Mosaic law, living in obedience to his heavenly Father. All those who belong to him are covered by him and are just as much citizens of the kingdom of God, just as much citizens of Israel as those who are ethnically so. Reggie, in Galatians 5, uh, Paul says that if you receive circumcision, then Christ will have no value or benefit. Um, but yet later in his ministry, he allows Timothy to be circumcised. Um, can you can you help me understand that? Yeah, well, you know, we we were talking about how if you add the shedding of your blood to what Christ did, well, that just doesn't work. And um, for Paul, once we're clear about about not needing to shed our own blood, and we got that straight, mm -hmm. then he is perfectly happy to talk with Jews about continuing uh, the act, the, the practice of circumcision. And in fact, Paul is accused time and again of going around telling Jews to stop being Jews, but Paul never does that. It's important to understand that Timothy's, uh, Timothy is a Jew on his mother's side. So I guess the real question is why he was never circumcised in the first place. Mm -hmm. And what Paul does is have him regularized in the eyes of the Jewish community. Now, it's not like Timothy has to get circumcised to be saved, but in order for Paul to gain any sort of access to a Jewish community that's already hearing him wrongly mm -hmm. saying that Jews should not practice Judaism, it's really important for him to have a half Jew who is part of his ministry team to, to show that he is a pious Jew even at the same time that, that he is a, a follower of Christ. So is that kind of like um, later on in his ministry towards the end when he's in Jerusalem and he takes the Nazarite vow that he's not doing away with Judaism per se, more that that Christ is that fulfillment of the Jewish faith. Yes, he would have Jews understand that the fulfillment of the story that they have been birthed in, that they have been immersed in, and that has shaped them is Jesus Messiah. And they don't have to step out of that story to have a relationship with Jesus the Messiah. So, Reggie, this, this letter then seems to be written to a church that's having a hard time mixing cultures. You know, you've got the, the Jews in the church and then you've got the Gentiles and trying to f really figure out w what does it mean to be the church. This, it's not just something that the early church dealt with, is it? I mean, we have a lot of different cultures in the church today. How, how should we go about blending 
Well, Graham, it is important, I think, to realize that for Paul, that whole blending of cultures was was not, um, it, 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 it wasn't secondary. It was at the heart of his gospel. And that's why he says so strongly here in Galatians 3, all those who have put on Christ, all those who have been baptized in him have put him on and are heirs. And that means there's no Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, free. And he really did expect that to get worked out in the hard stuff of life of Jews and Gentiles learning how to love each other, of slave and free learning how to love each other, masters and slave, um, slave and three, rich and poor, mm -hmm. people from all kinds of ethnic backgrounds. And that certainly that does mean different tastes and different preferences because part of what he was seeing was this great vision that, that goes back into the, in, well, like at the end of Psalm 22 of all, all, all the ends of the earth, all the families of the earth, as well as the faithful sons of Jacob and Israel, those who are rich, those who are poor, those who have already died, those who are not yet even being born, being, being this great assembly that, that the Messiah would bring together. Yeah, and yes, uh, it's, it's no different today. People are called in the skin that God gave them with the color hair, the color eyes, the same with the ethnic background that they have. But they are also called to relate to people who look, think, feel, speak a lot differently than they do around the person of Jesus Christ and to have a higher loyalty than just those backgrounds. So it's kind of like we are who God has made us to be and each, each one of us being different can see a little bit different perspective of God. And when we interact together, we get a more full picture of who he is. Well, as long as Jesus is, is at the center of it. I mean, I have been, you know, I've been in fellowships um, throughout the course of my years as a Christian where there have been really deep differences. You know, some of us are tongue speakers and some are not tongue speakers. Some of us feel like we should only sing psalms and we shouldn't have, you know, instruments to them and and others feel like we need to sing the hippest music around. Some of us really feel called to a ministry of evangelism and others feel like we need to feel called that we feel that we're called to ministry of social justice. Some people seem to have the gift of no matter what they do, they make money and other people can't, you know, <laughs> They would know how to spend it if they had it, but they don't know how to make it. And it's so easy for us to develop our spiritual relationships around lines of affinity and common likes and common stations in life. But the whole call of the gospel is to orient our lives around, around something else. And it's, it's not just being different. It's not just gathering people around me that are different just for the sake of difference. It's a matter of finding that which really binds, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. And so it means learning. It means being committed to relationships of heroic forbearance and saying, you know, I really don't, you know, I don't, I suspect I know who you're going to vote for in this uh, coming election. And that person stands for things that I think are totally wrong. But because you and I are brothers in Christ, I want to understand what it is about that person that, that attracts you. I might have something to learn from you. And, you know, across the board, if we define our relationship primarily around the, the blood that we shed, uh, the blood that we share that Jesus shed for us, and the spirit who taught us, as, as Paul says, to love one another and in that love, finding the law be fulfilled, well then, then I think we, we sense his pleasure and we know the kind of community that he's called us to be. And you know what? Then we become a city on a hill, the light of which can't be hidden.
Reggie, right, I've heard people say, you know, I'm under grace, so I don't have to obey the law. Um, can you help me understand the relationship between law and grace uh, and what the expectation is and how Paul helps us understand that in Galatians? Yeah, Dusty, that's, the people who say that have kind of a distant mem memory or faint echo of, of what Paul's doing in Galatians, but it's really, it's really off. In the first place for Paul, the law itself was a gift of God's grace. Mm -hmm. It was the law that helped people see their need for a redeemer. It was also the law that gave the charter for, well, here's what a people looks like when they are formed into the image of God and when they together are living as his people, as his kingdom, as his society, as his mm -hmm. city, as his family. And for, for Paul, the concern is the way that the, the, the law's gracious function of being the incubator for the birth and the career and the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's, it's done its job. It's brought us to Christ. And to the extent that it convicts us personally of our sin by showing us that we can't, that we can't keep the commandments, it's done a very gracious job for us. Mm -hmm. On the far side of that, for Paul, the law still stands because you know, he can sum up the whole law in love your neighbor as yourself. And he's got this sense of the direction that our lives are gonna go as they're transformed by God's spirit who's made us alive and is making Christ's life active in us is that it's gonna be in the direction of doing what the law calls for. But with the Galatians in particular, it's important mm -hmm. for them to understand that the dynamic of that transformation, the transformation of the person into one who bears the image of God is not through this, I must keep these commandments. It's through responding to the person who has embodied God's love for us receiving his work of redemption on the cross and the grace of forgiveness that we get because of his sacrifice. And then walking in the Holy Spirit who comes to live in us and to make Christ's life effective in us. And so that's why he talks in Galatians 5 about the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. And then he says, against these things there is no law. He wants these folks to lean into the person and work of Jesus Christ and his presence among them in the Holy Spirit and to learn to live in, in, in love. It's like, you know, when you, when you first learn to drive, you, you, know, you read this, this, uh, the, the, uh, the driver's handbook, but you can't, but the point is to learn how to, to drive. And at some point you need to get behind the wheel and, and drive. Then these folks have all that they need, all that they need in order to drive. And they're going like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna read the driver's manual while I drive. And he goes, no, you guys are gonna crash if you do that. Mm -hmm. You need to, all that the law needs to teach you is in you. The text is there, and now it's been embodied in Jesus. So live in him, and you know what? You will fulfill the law. You will find that you're being made over into the image of, into the image of Christ. So in that sense, like, law isn't like this bad thing um, that it really does it it is good and so but the Galatians are having a problem with following it when they should be living by faith is there any place where Paul kind of does the other thing where people are living too much without the law and so he tells them go back and look at that and do that what we'll see two lessons from now when we get to the Corinthians is people who are doing exactly the opposite. They think that they have so much 
arrived at the, at the great eschaton, that they don't need, in fact, it's interesting in 1 Corinthians 4, he says um, that you need, people need to be careful not to go beyond what is written. And throughout 1 Corinthians, he is drawing them back to lessons that they need to glean from Israel's experience in the wilderness and uh, particular commandments that God had, had given them. And by contrast, in Galatians 5, 6, he says, that, look, folks, the only thing that matters is faith working through love. With the Corinthians in chapter 7, of 1 Corinthians, he's going to say, look, the only thing that matters is keeping the commandments of God. So, and here's where we kind of get back to Paul's whole eschatology thing. He, what it makes him so profoundly good as a pastor is that he, he reads people's hearts and he reads their hearts in light of his sense of God's timeline. And the Galatians are trying to turn the clock back and go back under the law as though Christ had not come, as though, it was as though it were necessary for some other shedding of blood. And he's going, you guys don't get it. And to come at them with a lot of uh, ordinance keeping would be to just confirm them in their sickness. With the Corinthians, they think that they are so far beyond the constraint of, of the scriptures that he has to remind them of how much uh, of how much wisdom there is for us in, in Scripture. And so he calls them it's like out of a, you know, sort of a pretend future that they're in and says, no, you need to get back into the slo sloppy already not yet, where because we are still sinners, God's law still tells us what we need to know about who God is. And if we think that we can live apart from his rules, we're kidding ourselves. Now, Reggie, I've, I've heard people say that Paul does some kind of funky stuff with the Old Testament in Galatians. Like in chapter 3, uh, he's talking about Abraham's seed, um, saying that he, he wasn't talking about plural seeds but only one, and obviously that can only mean Christ. But then they say, but the original meaning was plural. And so it, Paul's just reading Jesus into the Old Testament. Is that what he's doing here? Well, I think he has learned to read the Old Testament in light of its fulfillment in, in Jesus. But when you go back to Genesis, I think you find on a closer read that he's reading the text for what happens in Genesis. And in Genesis 12 and 15, God gives the promise of seed. And, you know, it's a, it's a singular noun, but it's got... A multiple meaning. It's got a plural meaning. And he tells, you know, tells Abraham, your seed is going to be like the stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore, you know, innumerable. But Abraham understands immediately that that promise of multiple seed is going to have to be done through a singular seed. Thus, the, 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 the thus the, uh, the little, uh, scenario that plays out where he has uh, Ishmael through Hagar because he won't wait for the son through whom it's going to get done. And then by Genesis 17 and 22, it's very clear that we're talking about a singular seed. It's Isaac. And that's why the scene on on uh, Mount Horeb in chapter 22 is so dramatic because the means by which God would fulfill the promise, plural seed, his, it looks like it's going to be just aborted because God's told him to kill the one seed through, who, through whom it can be done. Now, you know, fast forward and Paul finally sees that the singular seed through whom God is going to bless the nations has been, has been Jesus. And so he takes that dense, complex idea and packs it all together in, in uh, Galatians 3. But it's not because he's not reading the original context. He does see that that original context was um, 
was a tremendously <laughs> fertile one mm -hmm. itself. Now that kind of makes me think about another question because Paul then goes to talk about the the seed through the children. He talks about um, Hagar and, and Ishmael and then Sarah and Isaac and you've got the, the, the bond woman and then the free woman. Um, he's, is what seems to be kind of a funky thing that he does talking about allegory and, and that driven by his reading of the singular and the plural seed? Well, again, what Paul is seeing is that in the history of redemption, the actual story as it unfolded in its original context is pointing to truths that are being realized right in Paul's own, own lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and the irony is uh, he sees in those who were championing physical Israel, earthly Jerusalem in his day, as being the culmination of the spirit that was at play in the, in the attempt to bring about God's promises through the flesh in the Hagar-Ishmael um, um, relationship. And what you have back in, um, back in Genesis is the attempt to force God's hand to, to make, to fulfill his promises mm -hmm. through the flesh okay. and not through God's own time and God's own way through God's own spirit. And so, you know, Ishmael goes out and, um, and then, you know, winds up re recipients of his own line of promise. He was promised that he would be head of a great nation. And, uh, where, in fact, where Paul had spent time um, in Arabia during his, uh, you know, three-year school in the discipleship of Christ, so to speak. There are a number of levels of, of irony here. It mm -hmm. so happens that Mount Sinai, where the law was delivered, is, is down in Arabia. And so he is, Paul is able to set up this contrast between these, these two Jerusalems, an, an earthly Jerusalem, and a, a heavenly Jerusalem, and the people of promise who are in the line of Isaac are now the church, and the people of the, of the, of the flesh, the people who think that God's plan for redemption has to be forced by us, not done by God that we respond to in faith. Originally, that was Ishmael, and now it's those who are paying a lot of attention to the earthly Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So the, the people that once were truly of the faith, who looked to physical Jerusalem, having not lifted their eyes now to Jesus, almost become slave children like Ishmael. Yes, and that's part of Paul's heartache mm -hmm. uh, for, his, for his fellow countrymen. Reggie, are there um, examples in the modern church today that uh, where churches underrealize uh, the kingdom of God? And you know, just thinking through that, are there problems? What kind of problems would that bring up? Well, you guys may have some thoughts on this uh, as well. I mean, in the in the U.S. church scene, there's I think there's a lot of legalism. I think there there are a lot of churches that that um, are happy for people n not to learn scripture deeply enough for themselves to make a lot of a lot of uh, informed decisions, and it almost seems like uh, try to keep people in spiritual infancy. Don't don't worry about that. We'll make those you know we'll make all those decisions for you. Yeah, I've um, I've been in churches where y you kind of get this feeling like if you start digging deep into the scriptures and using like big theological terms and all that sort of stuff like that it's almost elitist and so you know just don't you know 
don't use any words except you know the words that are in the Bible you know and you know if we even if we try and like explain what those means you know we're going beyond what the scriptures say and we need to stick to that yeah, and, and do you feel like you've ever seen uh, stuff that you would call underrealized? I know it's kind of a different way of thinking about things for a lot of people. I, I'm blank. <laughs> okay, well, that's all right. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to think of, uh, no. I mean, the only thing I can say is, is connect with that is just like a lack of discipleship, and um, but I don't know how that connects, so. You know, um, well, for, you know for a, a long time, believers were not really challenged to to learn scripture for themselves mm -hmm. and to be able to um, to read it the scripture was thought to be a closed book with too many possible interpretations and so you needed a magisterial church mm -hmm. to tell you what it what it means and for instance as as lovely as stained glass is in in big cathedrals if stained glass is there to tell the story, but doesn't invite me, but I'm kept illiterate and I'm not brought into um, a place where I can read scripture for myself and like and experience what Paul values in the letter to the Galatians about the the spirit of God working in you, and not just in the aggregate, but in individuals personally, people are just stunted in their growth. And he says, for, it's for freedom that you have, been, you have been set free. And so a lot of people's experience of, Christian, of Christianity around the world and over history has been just locked into permanent, infant, permanent infancy mm -hmm. because the church has not assumed the task and the responsibility of teaching and training people so that they can you know, uh, make wise informed judgments and so that, so that they can go and carry on the work of the ministry for themselves. I think another way that I've seen it work out too is that when you have this belief that the, the kingdom of God is something that's going to come primarily in the future, there's almost like this, you know, we're just going to get together and kind of sit in our huddles and sort of wait for that to come. And there's really not that much interaction in the world because you know if the kingdom is something that's coming later you know we just need to be prepared for it rather than kind of having this thought that the kingdom is in a, in a very real sense here now and going out and working is part of God's call in our lives. Well yeah the whole mentality that says um, the, the, ship is going to, the ship is going down and there's no point in polishing the metal on a sinking ship says that the kingdom has not come in enough of the fullness that Paul is talking about in the letter to the Galatians. And it's interesting that in this letter he talks about doing good to all people, especially the household of faith, but it does include doing good to all people. And Paul's sense of uh, Paul's sense of fulfillment of God's promises in this day would, I think, create more of a climate of going into the public square, exercising civic virtue, our responsibilities as citizens, as people who are called to different kinds of vocations and seeking to impact the world in the name of the king whose kingdom has in large measure come. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a place where um, that's an area in which um, eschatology is often underrealized in, in our churches. Right. Often in churches, there is this assumption that here's what Christian, a Christian culture would look like. And we sort of freeze Jesus into this mold. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the second commandment about uh, not making graven images is not just a literal thing. It, it's a call for us to consider everything about what we do in church as, as, as a creating, a, as a construct of a certain image of what God looks like and what the Christian life looks like. And many churches will...
take on sort of its, their own little folk culture where it's setting boundaries that keep different people kind of out. You know, there can be churches that are very Republican in their feel mm -hmm. and make people who are like more democratically oriented feel very much on the outside. And there are also churches that feel such a passion for kind of uh, more justice and mercy issues that make like business people feel really weird and and not and not welcome. Mm -hmm. I think one of the marks of a church that has this this um, uh, and and that's an uh, that's an underrealized eschatology that is afraid to let the spirit bring together people of vastly different kinds of persuasions mm -hmm. on particular kinds of uh, social and, and life issues. And, uh, and what Paul wants for us is to make Christ the center of our relationships and then go together to the scriptures to keep examining what his wisdom would be for us today. And that's part of what it is to live in this already not yet overlap. So what well, we've been talking about underrealized eschatology um, just makes me curious, you know, like what sort of problems that would arise of an overrealized eschatology uh, in the church today? How would how would you uh, address that? Well, well, those will be um, we'll see a lot of that when we when we talk about the Corinthians. But whenever the church feels like oh we're we're beyond scripture and we can make up. You know, we, we can, n not in, you're too ignorant, and so, you know, just let us tell you. Mm -hmm. But um, when we don't feel that, uh, we don't feel uh, compelled and constrained by this particular story, and we can kind of make up our, our theology for ourselves and recast God um, in, our, in our own image, mm -hmm. and then go live as though there are no rules and therefore, you know, mm -hmm. lots of, uh, lots of misbehavior, mm -hmm. then you're in, um, you're in that over-realized okay. sort of uh, right. setting. So it's, that it's, it's a real tension that we're called to, that, that we shouldn't be too much over on this under-realized side, nor should we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Um, but that we live in this really fine line tension that that s some of the promises have come true and some are yet to come and yes and so it just takes so this, faith yeah it takes a lot of faith it takes boldness and humility it takes uh, graciousness and and audaciousness at one and the same time mm -hmm. and it's a life that has to be lived out on our knees. Yeah. Reggie, uh, Paul in Galatians 6 talks about uh, the new creation, that that's, that's really what matters. Um, practically speaking, could you speak about, um, you know, what does that look like in our everyday life, you know, at our work, um, at home, with our friends? What does this, this living in light of the new creation really mean? Well, I think, Dusty, Paul has a couple of things going on in Galatians that are really pretty spectacular. And one is the sense that we individually have been personally made alive. We were dead, now we're alive. So he can say back in Galatians 5, 6, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing. What counts is faith working through love. He really believes that we're different people. Mm -hmm. We have this whole new capacity to be loving, to be patient, to be kind, to be good, that this was not true of us before. And then, and then the, the second thing that he wants the Galatians to see is that beyond just themselves, in the world, things are different. And that's where he says, like what you just quoted, Galatians 6, uh, 15, there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And just before that, he's talked about uh, how, to me, 
the world has been crucified and I have been crucified to the world. So I'm dead and I'm alive, but also there's an old world that is dead. And what has happened is that the Holy Spirit has been set loose on planet earth in a way that just wasn't the case in the old covenant. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think for Paul, New creation is his shorthand for the coming of the kingdom to the extent that it, that it has come as opposed to being not yet here in its fullness. It's, it is a, it's a shorthand for the invasion of the Holy Spirit showing up on, on the earth that once was what C.S. Lewis would call what the silent planet. Now, the earth is the earth is the place where the Holy Spirit has been put in play to bring redemption through the preaching of the gospel as we go and, and we do evangelism. I mean, consider the incredible uh, history of missions since the since the first century church from Judea, from Jerusalem to in Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. That process is just going on and on and on, and Christ is taking people captives and, and nations captive and people groups captive. Mm -hmm. So we're still seeing, you know, we're still seeing new creation being played out. Mm -hmm. And it also means that not only do I as an individual f live a life faith working through love in every aspect of my life, but I, I live out that love out in the world, in the marketplace, in, um, uh, in in my in my calling in the in the law courts on Wall Street, and I can expect the Holy Spirit to be with me, effecting in some measure as I seek to live out what it is to bear God's image, His new creation. And so my call, I mean, I'm not going to save the world. The church isn't going to just save the world by, you know, by um, political means and by you know taking control, but in ways that are really subtle and often really hard, really hard to see, and sometimes in ways that are profound, like when when William Wilberforce felt called not to be a minister of the gospel, but in, in church, but to minister the gospel in um, in a, in Parliament, mm -hmm. and year after year after year would put forth legislation calling for the end of slavery mm -hmm. in in England. And finally, got to see this measure of justice being um, being um, being brought in brought into effect. That's part of new creation: is believers believing that we can expect to see God taking ground in our day. So there's a real sense in which, you know, because we were talking about under-realized eschatology and over-realized eschatology earlier, that, that we as the church, through our actions and our words and just our, our everyday life, we're in a sense trying to push that coming of the kingdom, if you will, kind of push that forward and actually that, that God is actually using us to, to make his kingdom more real in the world than it was before. We pray it and then we live it knowing that it's for him to decide what he's gonna do. And you know, we can see an ebb and flow in history. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the kingdom seems to be uh, you know, on the rise and sometimes the kingdom seems to be in the retreat. And we just don't have God's, we don't have God's vision. Uh, we, we, all we have is his heart and his spirit in us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we are, we are privileged to live in a time of great suffering, which is, which is building the foundation for what God may do in the future. And mm -hmm. sometimes we live in these scary moments when we look around and we go like, my goodness, we're like in charge. And we have to be stewards of this responsibility and use the power that's ours for good instead of for evil, to, to, to serve others instead of to serve ourselves. Mm. So new creation, I think, 
along with the idea of faith working through love, are really not a really nice shorthand in Paul for the way that uh, he wants the Galatians to understand that despite their obsession with the commandments that they're misunderstanding in the first place, that God wants to work on this personal level and then and then out there in the world. The, the Corinthians that we're gonna get to uh, in a couple lessons uh, down the road, they have a very different problem. They are sure they've been remade. They're sure that Christ rules and Christ reigns. And so they have, they have these perspectives down here, the personal and then what's going on out there in the world. They think they got that. But they're doing it totally detached from the specifics of what God says about what life is supposed to look like. So interestingly, when Paul does his not circumcision, not not circumcision thing, he doesn't talk about faith working through love. He doesn't talk about new creation. He talks about new creation, but it's in another, it's in, in, a, it's in its own um and it's in, it's in its own way. What he talks to the Corinthians about is the need to keep the commandments of God, mm -hmm. uh, to read the word and, and, and to live it out. But again, back to the Galatians. They need to understand that a whole new force is in play, that, that um, Jesus' death and resurrection means life and history and everything is different. And we can live with a much more um, vibrant, robust ethic about what it is to, um, to be his people in the world around us. Mm -hmm. It sounds like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the Galatians were uh, legalistic and they were, they were stuck in the law is in a mechanic a yes. mechanical kind of way? I think so. Okay. So it makes sense. And I, mm -hmm. think, I think they were wrestling with, and I alluded to this in the lesson, I think they were really wrestling with how do I tame the beast? How do I gain control over my life? And they've they're been turning to the law and to circumcision as a means by which to get assurance of their salvation, to feel okay. And they're trying to do it by rules and the law instead of leaning more radically and more boldly into the finished work of Christ on the cross for them and the presence of Christ through the Holy Spirit in their lives to enable them to live boldly, freely, and as forgiven sons and daughters. But I, I interrupted. No, um, what I was thinking is, you know, in order to do that, to, to live in light of this new creation that Paul is calling the Galatians to, uh, that it would take great faith. Um, I'm just curious uh, how the Holy Spirit plays into that. Like, can you help me con make the connection between this, this faith that Paul is essentially asking them to get away from this legalistic uh, bent to, to begin to live in boldness? Uh, and how does the Holy Spirit... Uh, That's a great question. Yeah. Paul is going to articulate this uh, more straightforwardly in 1 Corinthians 15. And there he talks about how the, um, the, the, the uh, second man or the last Adam, Christ, has become life-giving spirit. And uh, that's, a, that's a, a, a condensed way of talking about a transition in Jesus' own ministry to his church. Mm -hmm. On the, on the earth, he ministered you know, in, in bodily form mm -hmm. and was confined to one place at a time. And he talks about this uh, in, in his final discourse in, uh, in John's gospel. Uh, he tells him, don't be sad because I'm going away. I'm going away so that you can do greater things mm -hmm. than, than you've been able to do because I'm gonna send, I'm not gonna leave you alone. I'm gonna send a paraclete. I'm going to send an advocate so that, uh, that I can be not just beside you, but I can be in you. Mm -hmm. And then Peter talks about the way um, uh, Peter in his sermon in, in uh, Jerusalem at Pentecost talks about how at his ascension, Jesus goes to the right hand of the Father and receives the Holy Spirit and then pours the Spirit out on the church. Well, for Paul, that is the Spirit of Christ 
that is on that is on the earth. When the Holy Spirit gets poured out on the church, and then the Holy Spirit starts to dwell in us and make us new, that's it's not some. The Holy Spirit isn't some entity apart from Christ. What the Holy Spirit has done is to come and bring the things of Christ to us, to use John's language. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit is to make us new and to make Christ alive in us. And so back to Galatians, Paul, his anxiety his prayer, his desire for the Galatians is that, remember what he says in in Galatians 4, that Christ be more perfectly formed in you. Mm. Well, what he's talking about is the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. at work in us, making us new. And it's like he says, it's faith working through love, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And then we're called to live out the new creation, and that is as those who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, we are called to live in a world where the Holy Spirit is at work mm-hmm. bringing a measure of justice, bringing people to himself, folding them into the church, and then ruling and governing the church. Um, that is Christ dwelling in the church. So the Holy Spirit has everything to do with it mm-hmm. because the Holy Spirit is the means by which and the way in which Christ himself is present to the church and working in the world. Mm-hmm. So when the paraclete typically you know, is translated as counselor, is that, does that do it justice in terms of what that, that really means? And- well, it says part of it um, mm-hmm. as as it's a, it's a legal term. It's one who will come uh, on, you know, and and be our advocate. Mm-hmm. And uh, for Paul, then that's that's John's language. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for Paul, we are ones who have been, you know, we were unrighteous, and now we have been made righteous. And so it's the Holy Spirit. For John, the Holy Spirit is going to come and is going to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, okay. and that's part of the that's part of the Holy Spirit's work. And that's an Old mm-hmm. Testament concept mm-hmm. of God coming to press His mm-hmm. covenant case against the um, His covenant lawsuit against uh, a, a wicked and sinful world. For for Paul, the the presence of the Holy Spirit is is there because we are no longer convicts as far as God is concerned. Mm-hmm. Jesus has taken the rap mm-hmm. for us. He has, he has uh, been cursed as he laid out his arms on the cross. Mm-hmm. And because we are now seen by God as being righteous, the Holy Spirit can dwell in us. Uh, now we are, we are holy as far as he is concerned. And he is, he is uh, if you will, taking taking back ground in our hearts and making us new, mm-hmm. sanctifying us, mm-hmm. and then working out, mm-hmm. working out uh, in our lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, Reggie, in, the, in the, f- the first part of Galatians, Paul spends a fairly large portion defending his own authority. Um, and you can kind you can kind of get the feeling like he's almost being a little macho and saying you know it's my way or the highway, um, but earlier on in his ministry he's submitted to the authority of the church whether it's at Antioch or Jerusalem. Where does where does the final authority lie in in when it comes to the church? Oh, okay, Graham. In the in the case of the Galatians, if we've got the timeline right. I think it's important to realize that Paul is dealing with some brand spanking new Christians who are really confused about how wh- where they should go. Mm-hmm. You know, they Paul had ministered to them, they had heard his message, believed it, received Christ, received the Holy Spirit, and then he he's gone. And now they're hearing people saying, Yeah, Jesus is good. Really good. 
but Paul didn't really tell you everything you need to know. He was kind of playing favorites with you and he wanted you to like him too much. So he didn't really tell you what bold obedience required. And Paul knew that he should have told you that there was some fine print and that the boys in the congregation need to get circumcised. And a lot of what Paul is doing is reestablishing their confidence in listening to him. And like you say, he, Paul is not a lone ranger. Even as he writes this letter, he has agreed to go down to Jerusalem to have the church um, talk it out. And I think that he has every confidence that they're going to decide the right thing about circumcision. And yet at the same time, he knows that he has been called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. He knows that Gentiles do not have to get circumcised. And he is, he is just out of his mind concerned that some of the folks back in Galatians are going to pull the snippers out before this, this council takes place. And so he wants to remind them of who it is who has preached the gospel to them. He wants to remind them of what they have experienced of the goodness of the Lord. And he wants to remind them of the slavery that they would be going back under if they would, if they would let themselves do this. So if you're talking about the timeline that, he, that he's going down to the council at Jerusalem, which ultimately does side with him. Right. Yes. So he's not, he's not trying to be a maverick, but he's really trying to be faithful to the gospel. So if we think about it for ourselves today, you know, when we kind of, when we find ourselves in tension between what's going on and you know what the church is saying and, and what the gospel says like how do we work those tensions out well um you you make a good point paul had himself uh indicated to to the galatians look i told you what the gospel is and if anybody comes and tells you something beyond besides what i told you already uh, an angel or even i myself let them be cut off, let them be an anathema. And what Paul, has, uh, what Paul is doing is saying, look, in Jesus, the crucified and risen Messiah, the whole biblical storyline, which is really the final uh, court of appeal, even for these people who want you to get circumcised, they're, they're doing it because they have a wrong read of that story. But that story, the story of creation, fall, redemption, is the normative story. Mm -hmm. And I have come to tell you that that story has come to a culmination point and a renewal point and a new creation point. And once that is set and it is established and it is fixed and it means you don't need to shed your blood because he shed his blood for you. What, um, and now that you have been baptized, you have received all the benefits that are being promised to you. They're already yours. And we together are called to be this new people of God. I can tell you that, th that I have told you the truth and whenever you hear countervailing voices, even the, if that voice would be mine, you can take it to the bank, that voice is wrong. So Graham, there's, um, I think there's the lesson, there's the lesson for us. Once the gospel has been put out there, the story of God's redeeming his planet through his son, who is the one that God had been, God had been ordaining all along to undo Adam's mess through the line 
of Abraham as anticipated in the covenant community uh, under Moses's um, uh, under Moses's uh, governance in Revelation, and then through the first united and then divided monarchy of Israel, all that culminating in the person and work of Jesus. Once that's out there, then that becomes the standard against which everybody, Paul himself, uh, measures everything. And so for us today, too, we have to listen uh, to the voices around us in our culture and in the churches and keep coming back to the Word of God as it tells us that story and it explains it to us and uh, is the means by which Christ becomes per personal to us in the Holy Spirit.